Andy. Hi, Resma. Hey, hey, Robin. How you doing? I'm good. I'm coming to you from Seattle. Yeah, I'm in uh, Minneapolis, the epicenter of craziness. So I'm in Minneapolis right now. Yeah, yeah. So how you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say overall, well. Right. Here we go. We'll be right back on. So, you know, you got some some uh, some some good things happening right now. You got a new book out. You you're getting back out here. Um, so so t t you want to um, talk to us about what the new book is about? Sure. You know, in White Fragility, I set out to to establish that systemic racism exists. Uh, it's in the framework of white supremacy. It shapes all of our lives. And, you know, if we can't open to that conversation, we can't have the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in this book, I didn't work to establish the right. existence of systemic racism. I started with the assumption that, you know, my readers were with me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to answer a provocative question that I raised in White Fragility and that I get asked about a lot, mm -hmm. which uh, it's a claim that I made, which is, that I think white progressives mm. cause the most daily harm mm. Uh, mm. across race. Mm. And um, this, this book basically unpacks how we do that. Mm. Uh, I'm not a white nationalist. Uh, <laughs> and my, my, enactment, my enactments don't look like right. uh, what I would think of as very explicit avowed racism, but it That's looks right. like something. That's right. <laughs> uh, I'm in the same water. I've been shaped mm. by the same uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to offer some breaking it down yeah. for those who were with me. Yeah. What do you, what if, you know, it's, it's only been out for a little while, but like, like less than a couple of weeks, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. It came out yeah. on June 29th. What's been, what's been, um, what's been surprising to you in terms of either the acceptance or the rejection of it? That it, the rejection has been a little quieter than I thought it would be. <laughs> Um, there was an, uh, an openness in the beginning to white fragility and maybe too much of an openness. Uh, mm -hmm. And as Carol Anderson so powerfully argues in white rage, every inch of black progress is met with white rage. Mm -hmm. And we saw what happened uh, during the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my book was only one piece, but it was, um, it was an, an explore, explanation or an uh, entry point for a lot of white people that really was mm. useful. Mm -hmm. um, and then we see where we are now. Yeah. And once the critiques began to happen, there was a kind of, it felt like a pile on, like it became fashionable then to reject right. um, uh, the, 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 car, the context. That's right. So I didn't think this book would be reviewed with openness. Mm. Um, I mean, nothing is done with openness because we're not, um, a, there's no human objectivity. Right, right. Um, but, you know, there's a, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and check out this book and see what I think. And then there's, I have already decided um, that I'm not going to like this. So yeah, I, yeah. I'm actually seeing a little more openness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, when you told me about that you were writing this book months and months ago. I was, you know, I, I thought you was going to get tagged right at right at the beginning. I mean, I thought I thought I, you know, and I remember us talking about it. I thought you were going to get really tagged because as long as you're talking about white folks that other white folks can differentiate themselves from, like those are the bad white people, right? As long as you, as long as people have, as long as white bodies have a sense that that's what's happening, yeah. I think, I think, um, I think then then, you know, pe people feel good about, you know, reading your book and telling everybody, look, I'm reading White Fragility and all that. Different but now, now you, you're getting close to the, like close to the bone, right? Where you talk about not just those white folks over there, but us white folks, right? That, 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 that we also uh, are advantaged by and perpetrate harm in the ways that we do it. Um, and so I thought you was going to get, I, I, you know, I thought I, I expected in me answering you that answer, asking you that question that you were going to get like, man, they coming for me. But, but well, you know, one early. of the ways, one of the ways I cope uh, is that I'm not on social media. So maybe they have. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, but if, if a white reader took anything from white fragility, uh, 
well, one key piece is our work is never done. Yeah. The moment we are complacent, we're yeah. going to step in it. This is circulating 24 seven, 365. Right. And um, anytime I think it's over there and not over here, I'm, I'm a part of the problem. Yeah, and yeah. if I may, Resma, um, you know, I'm writing about nice racism. Now, this is a moment when, you know, white nationalism is on the rise. Mm -hmm. uh, recruitment uh, among young uh, white male youth is, uh, you know, um, accelerated. Mm -hmm. We literally have laws on the books mm -hmm. uh, that say you cannot say that racism is real. That's right. That, that's what the whole CRT thing is about. That's exactly you cannot right. say that racism is real. Right. Uh, we have voter suppression. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I'm writing about nice racists like me mm -hmm. that wouldn't be um, agreeing with any of that. And I'd love to know your thoughts when I say that I think well-intended, open-minded, justice-loving white folks like me are actually the ones that cause the most daily harm. Yeah. But what would you say to that as a Black man? I would, I would say you're absolutely right. And I'm glad you wrote the book for white folks. Um, and, and I would say that one of the things that happens, um, I, think, I think something that happened with your book that also started to begin to happen with my book was the idea that once you read it, then you were absolved from doing any damn thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, think, I think what happens is that people read books like My Grandmother's Hands or White Fragility and they and and especially white folks, white folks will read it and read that stuff and and organize all different types of book clubs and and meetings to talk about it and debate about it, but are not going to do anything. They're go, they're simply going to acquire knowledge, cognitive knowledge, um, and 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 when it and when you talk about it in the book that you have to do something, you like, you literally, that, that it is not about just um, um, being quote unquote woke. It is about having some sense of what's going on and then figuring out as white people, how to begin to apply what it is that you've learned, not just, not just use it to, to kind of cultural other white people. Um, and so, and so um, when, the, the idea of talking about it from the kind of progressive side, I think is really important because, because I think one of the things that happens with progressive is that they, 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 um, they kind of um, disidentify or extricate themselves from the bad white people as if it, as if it, as if racism is, is only about transaction. And what we know is that it is not, it is structural and it, it is philosophical. It lives and breathes inside of you because you have been advantaged by a system that says that the white body is the standard and has deemed itself the standard of humanness, right? And it was one of the things that I was just talking this weekend with, with uh, um, some of the people that I'm training is that three-fifths human is literally a mathematical equation that people put time and effort into figuring out the, 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 the deviance by which black bodies were deviant from humanness, right? <laughs> I mean, it is, if you think about it in those terms, and so, and so certain people benefited from that mathematical equation people continue to benefit and are advantaged by that mathematical equation. And it doesn't, it doesn't just go away because you're nice or kind. Yeah, and that, that's another point I'm trying to make is that niceness doesn't indicate the absence of racism. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, a culture of niceness uh, protects systemic racism. I, I, I get this image of like this thick blanket or fog laying over it because yeah. a, a culture of niceness uh, tends to be a passive aggressive, yeah. Uh, yeah. conflict avoidant culture. Yep. It's a culture that not conscious, none of this has to be conscious. It doesn't That's matter. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, but it assumes the white experience is a universal experience. That's right. So I feel comfortable here. Everybody's friendly here. Uh, therefore, you must be comfortable and you must experience us as friendly. That's and right. and my smile must signal to you, does it not, that I'm not racist. Right. Um, now, if you don't smile back, that changes pretty quick. Yep. Um, 
you know, in some ways the I remember a friend of mine, a black woman coming home from Whole Foods saying, my God, it's exhausting to go shopping at Whole Foods. The over, <laughs> the over smiling, right? That's right. And, and she, mm -hmm. now some people may be listening and saying, well, what's wrong with smiling, right? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with niceness? So don't mis mishear me. I'm mm -hmm. all for niceness. Right. <laughs> Right. It's it's the idea that niceness indicates the absence of racism. Yeah. And there's a difference between, you know, smiling when you pass someone in the grocery store, which sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And and the kind of smile that is asking for validation and approval. Yeah. I need to convey to you that I'm not racist and I need you to convey back to me that you see that I'm not racist. Yeah. Um, and that's how all of that landed on her. It, it wasn't just natural. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's almost, and I can I can say as a white person, almost an urgency yeah. that yeah. I telegraph to you yeah. my lack of racism. And I opened the book with a just cringe inducing story of needing, uh, feeling very urgent to establish to a couple of black folks that I wasn't racist. And how did I do it? Mm. Told them how racist uh, my family was. Yeah. Um, repeated every joke and every every comment, yeah. followed by, can you believe they said that? Yeah. Can you believe they thought that? And I thought, you know, here's what I'm showing you. I, I see that that's racist. I would never say that thing that just came out of my mouth. That you just said. That's right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I recognize that I actually subjected them to racism exactly. all evening. And yet in my head, I went home thinking I was down and that they knew that I was down. Yeah. And that's another piece around white progressiveness. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there's a seductive quality to kind of burying your soul in front of uh, uh, black and indigenous and bodies of culture, right? They're, they're, it, this is at least the dynamic that I've seen. <clears throat> um, and that in, in some way is supposed to either uh, let uh, bodies of culture know that you are down, connected, and that you see what's going on. And really what ends up happening is that it sows the seeds of distrust. It sows the seeds that you, re it's, like, it's like, we talked about this before. It's like when white people come up to me and say that they're an ally. And one of the things that you always say is that how would Resma know that if you hadn't said it? Right? Is that how how would I like? And, and who are the people? It is not enough for you to tell me you're an individual ally. That is inadequate. So, so one of the things I say to white folks is that this idea of niceness and kindness. I don't want you to spit in my food. I don't want you to hurt my children. I don't want you to call me the N word. Right? That 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 this I. But that idea of niceness and kindness, um, if you could call it that, is inadequate to actually deal with racism and white body supremacy if that's if that's your kind of shore's edge if that's where it stops for you then that is inadequate and i think i think what ends up happening is that there is this kind of uh like like here we we have minnesota nice right this it's like and it's really a very passive aggressive like there's a seethingness underneath the smile right there is a there is a don't tread too close, right? And, 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 and bodies of culture have had to pick up and understand uh, uh, the field, how, like how it operates. And I think because white bodies are so, um, are so advantaged by the system, they collectively don't really even have to examine those pieces. It's like, if you're nice, you be nice to black people, you be nice to other people, and that's enough, right? That's as far as you go. And what that does is it makes for very surface type relationships. It, it eliminates any type of intimacy. It makes, it makes white people very fragile when it comes to race, right? Mm -hmm. they can't tolerate, they can't tolerate very much, and I'm including progressives. Um, I was I was watching a thing about I think this happened about six months ago and maybe you saw it on the news. It was um, it was uh, a, a function where um, where a bunch of uh, 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 black children um, were at some function and they happened to be there with Nancy Pelosi, right? And they're singing. I believe it's the Black National Anthem. And so there's a mother holding her little baby, her, her maybe about five or six year old child, a uh, 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 little girl was, was sitting, standing in front of her and they were singing. And so the camera was singing. 
she looks down at the little girl and then the little girl looks up at her and turns back around and Nancy Pelosi grab, touches her hair, mm, okay. right? Strokes her hair. And you watch the little black girl kind of like, like this. And then she looks up at her mama and she goes, she just touched my hair like that. Now, she's a nice progressive. You probably would never hear her say the N word. You probably would, would uh, say, oh, that was a faux pas, all that different type of stuff. But that was damaging. That was vicious, right? Now, in the context of that, like we would say now some people would hear me say that and they say, How is that vicious? That that's vicious. Yeah, she she did, you know, she shouldn't have done that, right? You don't touch people without the permission. But how is that vicious? Well, it's vicious if you don't understand the only way you can say it's not vicious is if you don't understand the context, right? It is it is it is relatively new that black bodies have any stewardship over dominion over their own bodies, right? For most of our history, the white body, including white women, mm -hmm. have had access to our bodies in ways that we could not say no, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so to touch a black child's hair speaks to that horror, speaks to that terror, speaks to that, 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 that there are no boundaries by which the white body does not have access to the black body. And so white progressives don't really think that they need to go and delve into that piece because they already are aligned with Martin Luther King or Resma or Robin or whoever it is. And so they get a free pass, but that free pass is really not a free pass. It's there. It's it's a. It's just the other side of the devout racist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. it again. I'm going to put air quotes around subtle because subtle to me, mm -hmm. not to you necessarily. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what I pull out of that is there's an entitlement. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's there's not having to know the history. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't. I don't have to know that. I don't have to know your reality right i could be seen as qualified to lead or do virtually anything right including run an organization with thousands of employees that in their mission statement says we value diversity exactly i can be seen as qualified to lead that organization with absolutely no understanding whatsoever of your reality no ability to engage with your reality yep. um be, to be really honest, no interest That's right. in knowing your reality. But from the time you were very, very, very small, you've had to know more. Had to. Had to. And those are the pieces that I, I think we, you know, we don't understand when we say, God, it was just, she, she meant well. Right? Right. We right. also focus on the intentions, but it, but it speaks volumes. Yeah. Um, I just have to th throw one in there just uh, because you're from Minneapolis and I'm from the Pacific Northwest. And that yeah. uh, is, I'm from Canada. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> uh, is a, a common uh, form it. of credentialing. Yeah, and yeah. Credentialing is something that I talk about a lot in the book because um, I see it all the time. And mm. credentialing are the, the, the moves, I call them moves, but the evidence that white people offer up to establish mm. that we are not racist. Right. Um, right. I marched in the 60s. I had a black roommate in college. Uh, I, I just have to say, we didn't even know race wasn't biological in the 60s. So, it, right. so if yeah. you think something you were involved in 60 years ago certifies you for the rest of your life, right. you're actually just you're actually just revealing that you don't understand. And right? you're revealing to to bodies of culture that you're dangerous. Like when yes. when 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 we hear people say stuff like that, what happens to us is okay, I need to watch you. I need to, I need to be clear that the thing that you think you've already mastered, you, you're, you're actually, you actually have not mastered. And in that, you may actually harm me in ways that if I give you access, you, you, you will be oblivious to the ways that you're harming, right? right. Um, yeah. Like if yeah. you don't know that that's not convincing, if you don't know that the, that, that evidence is actually kind of um, ridiculous, that's right. Right. That's right. And, and that I'm rolling my eyes in my head. Right. If you don't know that, then right. Um, right. you're likely not going to be open to any feedback to the contrary, because your identity, that urgency that I mm -hmm. that I have felt to mm -hmm. establish that I'm not racist yeah. is about 
my very identity and right. and what I believe would be true about my moral character. Exactly right. Based on what the simplistic way we're taught to understand racism. It's That's just it. a matter of good people versus bad people. Yeah. Speaking of moves, there's one that I'd love to take this incredible opportunity because you are a uh, racial trauma specialist. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the moves that white progressives will often make in a conversation about racism is moving to their own trauma. Yeah. Certainly their own forms of oppression, but suddenly, oh, my trauma is coming up. I, I don't think I can continue to engage. Um, this is too painful for me. Mm -hmm. And so any, any thoughts about, and let me just be really clear. Many, many people have trauma and trauma Absolutely. is real. Right. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and say for white people, talking about racism, getting feedback on our racism is not in and of itself traumatic. Mm -hmm. And I would say those conversations are not the place to bring your trauma in. Right. So any thoughts you have on that from your experience? Yeah, a couple of different thoughts. First, first one is that just before I came on with you, I was scrolling through the news and, 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 uh, came across this headline where the Texas State Senate had just approved a bill that says you can no longer teach that the Ku Klux Klan was racist and morally wrong. Did that just pass? You 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 okay. Google it right now, it's up there, right? Okay. Um, and that and in addition to that, you can't teach anything about Susan B. Anthony. You can't teach anything about uh, indigenous uh, genocide. You can't teach anything about enslavement. Like like there's these all of these things, and um, for me, uh, when when I'm kind of thinking about this, this idea that we can just kind of be nice and therefore uh, and therefore people are not actually um, taking away things or taking things from us, right? That that racism is an act is a, is an action. It is not just a, a feeling or a thought, right? Um, I think I think is where I think a lot of times white progressives get um, get 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 um, tripped up is that they they think that sometimes they think that feelings and whether or not somebody is a quote unquote good person or whether or not somebody is um, is just made a mistake. Um, uh, glosses over the idea that racism is a functioning, operating, vicious structure and philosophy, right? And so, um, when I when I'm doing my work, one of the things that happens is that I know that when I'm doing my work in in terms of somatic abolitionism, and I'm training white bodies, I know that white bodies as a collective, more times than not, collectively, really have no efficacy. Or, um, or uh, with race, like like really none as a collective, right? And so I already know that that ch there's going to be charge at some point happening in the relationship between me and them because because the charge is not something that has been metabolized. It has not been something that has been worked with between the bodies. There's no way that that Resma can go walk through the world and not understand the uh, the charge of race the pressure of race, the weight of race, the direction of race, the sensation of race, the meaning making of race. I can't, my feet can't hit the ground and I go to walk outside my door and think that, oh, I don't even have to worry about it, right? It's just, you know, I don't really have to worry about race because that would leave me vulnerable to, in a system in which the white body is seen as human and my body is seen as deviant from him. And so, one of the ways that I think white folks a lot of times get around that, especially progressive white folks, is that they take parts of their subjugated selves, right, or parts of their marginalized selves, and they recenter that as something that needs to be uh, that needs to be atoned for or dealt with or looked at, right. At the same time, unwilling to say at the same time that they just that they just centered their marginalized self, they're also centering their whiteness at the same time, right. And and I will tell you some of the most some of the most like knock down drag out things that I've had with people is that move right that dodge just like like being it like what like address address my address the fact that I am dealing with 
sexism, right? As, as a white woman, right? Address the fact that I'm dealing with sexism, but I am unwilling to deal with sexism um, as it relates to black women, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when you say that, then white women who are not interested in, go, especially progressive who are not interested in going deeper will make moves in order not to, in order not to, to, to work with that charge, that 500. Now that is not to say that sexism does not show up. I am saying that there's a particular move that progressive make, progressives make by centering their marginalized or subjugated self to avoid dealing with the white pieces. Yeah. And as I often say, you know, from a very early age, I understood that the world was unfair for girls. Right, <laughs> um, right, and right. I've spent most of my life being aware of that, thinking about that, focusing mm -hmm. on that. I swim against the current. It's clear to me uh, what I have not spent the majority of my life looking at is where I, spit, I swim with the current and where I have participated in, colluded with, and benefited from someone else's oppression. Yeah. And centering racism does not deny that okay. for me as a white person. Um, for me, it's been the most powerful, uh, the most learning edge, because it's much harder to sit in that place. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to sit in the place of I've been victimized, right? right? right. And so there's no real growth for me there. Right. Um, right. And not to mention that it, what it does to your experience. Yeah. So you used a term that I'm not going to assume that the listeners may know and um, somatic abolitionism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because, because I come at this uh, from, a, from a therapist, I'm a, I'm a LICSW and been doing trauma work for like 30 years um, in one way or another. Um, I have a ten, I, the way that I approach this is that I believe that trauma literally lives in the body that racialized trauma literally lives in the body, that it is historical, it is intergenerational, it is persistent institutional, and it is personal stuff all balled in together. And, 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 and as it relates to, to black and indigenous and other bodies of culture, <clears throat> we have had to be uh, and understand that we, have, we come from a line of people that had to kind of figure out how to navigate this idea that the white body deems it has deemed itself the supreme standard of humanness, right? When I talk racism, that's, that's my rubric. That's where I start from. I start from saying, okay, can, can, that, that when I say that white folks are racist, I am saying that they are advantaged by a structure that deems them to be human right, simply because of pigmentation and used all of the structures available to them to reinforce that ethos and that philosophy. And that other bodies were deviant from that, whether you're talking about Asian bodies, whether you're talking about indigenous bodies, whether you're talking about black bodies, that that idea was interwoven into the military, interwoven into the justice system, interwoven into the legal system, interwoven into the medical system. And so, so when I'm talking about somatic abolitionism, I'm saying that if we don't abolish white body supremacy in the body, get curious around how it shows up in a somatic way, like in a visceral way, in the clinching, in the, lot, in, in, in the locking down, in what happens to my voice when I see injustice, how did the, how did the impact of little white children um, participating in over 4,500 lynchings in America, right? How did that affect both their horror response and their protective response? The, and how did that affect their voice? How did that, that how, how did they understand and what got passed down in that understanding that when you see horror, you keep your damn mouth shut. That's how you make it through this, right? To watch a lynch, to have a young nervous system watch a lynching and participate in lynching, what happened to white folks in that context, right? And then what got passed down as standard, right? So somatic abolitionism for me is, can, do you have enough courage to begin to interrogate and investigate and examine the impact of 
of, of this viciousness of white body supremacy, not just the advantage, but the impact. What did you lose by participating in this structure and, 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 and how does that show up in the language of the body? Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking and nothing happening in your body in a society in which racism is the norm, not an aberration is also uh, meaningful, right? right. Um, all babies cry. Okay, I'm right. gonna go. I'm, all babies are born crying. Right. Something happens that at a certain point, boys, those who are assigned and socialized into mm -hmm. the gender male, mm -hmm. don't cry anymore mm -hmm. or have a hard time accessing. That's not benign or neutral. It's not yeah. natural. Right. It's a function of conditioning, but it also functions to uphold the very system yep. that inculcated it. Yeah. And I think. Um, for me, I'm never going to say the N word, right? Mm -hmm. I don't say that and right. so forth. I'm a white progressive. Right. Now, is the N word deep within me? Yes. yes. I, I, I was born into and raised in this culture. Right. Um, and I have absorbed it. It's mm -hmm. deep in there, the anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I move through a society in which racism is the norm in racial comfort. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just I'm articulating this because I want to help white progressives see what this looks like. It's not the extreme stuff, right. but but to move through a world every single day where racism's the norm and be comfortable. Mm. Let me mm. just put it like this: I'm comfortable in a racist society. Mm. I mean, that in itself mm. is a big piece mm. of it. And mm. for mm. me, the deepest message of all of white mm -hmm. supremacy. Mm -hmm is that there's no inherent loss in, yeah. living, in living a segregated life that I was never meant to know to know you, Resma. I was mm -hmm. never meant to love you. I was mm -hmm. never meant to see you or mm -hmm. care about you. Mm -hmm. And I was also never meant to feel I'd lost anything of value in not That's knowing, right. seeing, or caring exactly about right. you. And that so many white people see white space as racially neutral. <laughs> so if you if you ask uh, white people, what are some of the ways your race has shaped your life? And I've been seeing this for the last several decades, they will begin to share a story about a black person yeah. or some early incident or what their parents <laughs> thought about black people or how close they lived to black people. And of course, that's not the question. That's and right. It's not answering the question, but it shows how unracialized our own identities are and that we can't conceive of race without um your presence that's right right but every single moment that i spend in white space so i want i want all the white listeners to think about how many weddings you've been to mm -hmm. that if they weren't all white they were pretty close how many funerals that we go cradle to grave not only in segregation with no sense of loss, but using the absence of black people mm. as the measurement of value. Mm. Mm. The whiter the space, the more status it has, and mm. the, the more presence of black people in the space, the less status it has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's circulating. It's, I, I don't even know how to articulate this. It's active, white yeah. space. Every moment I'm in it, I'm being reinforced and socialized into white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the layer at, at which we have to start to look at it. I'm not going to identify it in whether or not I can be friendly to you or right. we go to lunch or even if I was married to you. Exactly it's, right. It's, it's a, a much deeper level. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I, we I, we just saw a thing. I think we only got like two minutes, but I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't say if I didn't if we didn't say this piece that and, and I just I'm going to just kind of say this to anybody that's listening to this to, to me and Robin talk right now and what's popping off in your head is that this is CRT. <laughs> Let me say this. The only thing that CRT is is a decentering of whiteness as the only way to tell a story. That's, that's all that CRT is. Critical race 
theory is about the fact that that the the theory the prevail here's what I said is that the prevailing thought right now right is in CRT right non critical race theory that's the prevailing thought right that's the and so and so and so what most what a lot of white folks want to do especially the devout ones what they want to say what the, what the texas uh legislature just did is they say that ncrt still to always shall has been and always be the rule of the land we don't want to examine uh what has happened in america we don't want to examine the the fact that we keep talking about our founding our founding fathers and they were benevolent slave owners and all of you know enslavement right all of that different things we don't want to talk about that from the perspective of resma or from the perspective of indigenous people who were genocided off the land or from the perspective of the people whose 751 children were buried behind a boarding school in Canada. We don't wanna talk about their perspective. Well, what we wanna have is a non-critical view. And so for all of y'all that keep hearing about CRT and you're like, man, I'm nervous about it. I don't really wanna, if you have had, if you have read a Howard Zinn book, <laughs> That's CRT. It is. It is the idea that you are take you are decentering whiteness as the only story by which we will evaluate um, America. And so, and so, I just needed to say that because I know there's people probably listening and hearing us and say, "Oh, that's CRT," and I will say, "Yes," and it makes you uncomfortable. And and I'm glad it does. It, but but you have to have to understand what it actually means. So. Yeah. Hmm. All right. I think I'm, are we ready for some questions? I think so. <laughs> Hi, Resma. Hi, Robin. Yes. Hi. Glad you're ready. There are a lot of questions. <laughs> so here we go. Someone asks, don't racists, neo-fascists cause more daily racial harm than white progressives? Uh, I'll speak to that and then, uh, okay, Resma. Um, first of all, odds are, I, I can only imagine how unsettling it would be to be interacting with someone you knew was a white nationalist, but odds are on a daily basis, black folks are not interacting <laughs> with white nationalists. They're interacting with me. Mm -hmm. um, they're interacting with you, Andy. They're interacting with, you know, their workplace that is filled with white people, <laughs> or at mm -hmm. least the leadership team. Mm -hmm. um, and we are the ones that send people of color home exhausted mm -hmm. uh that is the theme i hear over and over mm -hmm. particularly from um people of color that are one of a few mm -hmm. and that tends to be black people mm -hmm. one of a few particularly the higher up you go in an organization yes. it's exhausting yes. and it's exhausting in a way that you can't get your hands on because it's not the clear stuff right um and so you know i I don't want to minimize what is happening in this country in terms of policies and so forth, mm -hmm. um, but we uh, we need our energy <laughs> yes, right. uh, to fight it. So, what yeah. would you say to that, Rosemary? I'd, I'd say I'd say it's I'd say white progressives look at January sixth and go, see, those are the bad people. They're the ones that went up into the Capitol and crapped all over the floors and killed some police officers and did all, those are the bad people. And I think, I think um, when my wife comes home and she says to me, I don't know how much longer I'm gonna be able to work with these people. The, the viciousness and the ways and the things that they that they that they don't say, but there's a seethingness that I should not be here. There's a seethingness that I am only here because not because I'm intelligent, I know what the hell I'm doing, right? But because I got a leg up. And 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 that those pieces make my wife sick, not just sick like i'm sick of these people but sick in terms of her her not being able to sleep in terms of her cortisol levels in terms of high blood pressure in terms of all of that different type of stuff so when i hear somebody that asks the question aren't the white national it's all vicious it is pervasive and it is persistent 
on bodies of culture. It is pervasive and persistent on black bodies specifically. It is pervasive and persistent on indigenous bodies specifically. And for us and for people to, to think that those are the bad white people means that what they're, what they're doing is not having a systemic understanding of what racism actually is. Robin, may I ask, why are we focused on white people versus focusing on people of color? It seems this anti-racism conversation is getting more focused on whites. Should we be talking about white folks? Is this part of the healing process? I am debating these questions all the time as a person that does not only anti-racism work, but also equity work. Um, well, for far too long, we have offloaded all of this onto people of color, right? You yeah. experience racism, so if I want to learn about it, um, I'll just observe you, listen to you. This idea that I am innocent, I'm outside of this, and that racism happens to you, um, but I'm not part of the equation, right? As if it happens in a vacuum. And, and I'm, I'll say something bold <laughs> at the risk that we're on YouTube. White people are the problem. Um, you know, everybody has bias. You know, uh, Resma can have bias towards me just because I'm white. Everybody has bias. Systemic racism happens when one group's collective bias is backed with legal authority and institutional control. Resma's group and their collective bias have not been in the position to enact policies and practices that limit my life. Mm -hmm. And my group has and continues to be. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we've looked at Black people and said, you know, said how sad that you experienced this. And I, I hope that you don't, but I'm glad I'm not part of it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we all have a role, but I, I would say white people wield the greatest responsibility mm -hmm. um, because we set this up, this mm -hmm. system, and we, um, we protect this system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the master's tools dilemma, as Audre Lorde so powerfully articulated, um, we're inside this construct. None of us yeah. are free of it. There's no free right. space that is clean, uh, in, in, including Canada, um, you know, <laughs> or wherever, right? That, right. that it's not um, at play. Mm -hmm. So yes, at the same time that white people need to get in, involved, we're going to end up also centering ourselves. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's one of the many tensions that mm -hmm. go with it. Um, mm -hmm. But you're not going to change racism if you don't um, change white people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that, that that consciousness change doesn't lead to actual policy change. Yeah, yeah. And I just, I come at it just a little bit differently. Um, and the difference is that I don't equate equity work with living embodied anti-racism um, uh, and cultural development. I don't, I, I don't think they're one and the same. As a matter of fact, in a lot of the equity work that I have participated in and seen, many times the idea of race and the charge of race gets put off in equity work, right? It, 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 it becomes a way around dealing with the viciousness and the brutality and the terror of race, right? Or of, of white body supremacy and racism. And so for me, um, um, developing a living embodied anti-racist culture, right? Is what, I'm, is what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to do equity work and give people tips and tools how to navigate this, right? That's not, that's not my first foray. My first foray is to teach people how to actually begin to temper and condition themselves so they can actually hold and work with the charge of race. Listen, for four and five, for, 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 for 250 years, Black people were legally raped in this country. Now, just as, as y'all hear me say that, notice what happens for you in your body. When you hear me say that, Resma, I am descended from people who were raped for 250 years legally. What is, what is your role as a white body to, to making sure that your children understand that, that your children have some sense 
of that. That you are make you that you are create that you want to create something to make sure that that does not happen again, and that your children don't participate in anything like that. For me, it is not about um, just doing some equity work or going to the nearest black person and, and extract it. I think we have to have white people doing and working um, collectively on these pieces and not just intellectually. I believe that, 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 that white people have to get intimate with each other and commit to each other from now until they die to, a, to ushering in a living embodied anti-racist culture and practices. For me, that's, you know, I, me and you, me and you talk, do, are doing this work. I just come at it from a different angle. My angle is if you don't help, if white people do not establish a anti-racist culture, which does not exist, that does not exist collectively uh, uh, among white people, a, li a living embodied anti-racist does not exist. They have to begin about, be about the business of, make, uh, of, of ushering that in. And, um, and, and so for me, equity work is, is not gonna get that. Uh, uh, extraction from black people or extraction from indigenous people or, 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 uh, or DEI work, that's not gonna get you to that. So that's, that's the way I come in. Another question, this one from Megan. For Robin, would you say credentialing is similar to virtue signaling? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you define trauma in the context of this conversation, someone asks. And so, let me just, oh, okay. okay. Ahead, I would just say ahead. to Megan, try to show, not tell. I mean, maybe yeah. just the simplest way it, it, is it. if it's truly within you, it's going to come through and mm -hmm. you don't have to establish you know, your virtue or your credentials or because you're just, you are, you be different. You don't so always That's necessarily right. have to do different, if, if that makes sense. Anyway, go ahead, uh, Resma. That B word is so important, right? How do you be, not only how, what do you do? How do you be? And B has a texture to it. Being has a, is, is part of being able to sense into the nuance of dissonance, sense into the nuance of resonance, sense into it. But, and, and cognition itself won't get you to that, to, to that being piece, right? So in the context of, of this conversation, when I'm talking about trauma, I'm talking about anything that happens uh, uh, and I'm talking about it on fractals. I'm talking about it from an historical place, from an intergenerational place, from a persistent institutional place and from a personal place. And what I'm saying is that, that trauma is anything that happens to you that's too much, too fast, too soon or too long uh, paired with something reparative that should have happened that didn't. And so, and so for me, when I'm talking about trauma or racialized trauma, I'm talking about the impact of the concept of race and, and racialization and how the race, the, how the whole concept of race as it is used um, here in America and, and was exported across the world is really a species question. Right, the race question in this country has always been a species question, and what I mean by that is that when you, when Europeans and the elite white bodies started to begin to talk about race, their 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 root was talking about uh, was talking about race from a species place, a race of dog, a race of cat, a race of bird, a race. Right, that's how they talked about race. Right, and they applied that to human beings. Right. So pigmentation would be a shorthand for who was human and who was not. That concept of race is a at its, at its root is a species concept. And many times when we're talking about race, we're talking about it from a transactional place, not from a place of speciesness. And you can tell who is more human based on their pigmentation. And then, and then this, the, these elite white bodies created a whole structure around that idea, that shorthand. And, and, and many white people don't want to deal with that level of it. They want to deal with it or, you know, you shouldn't say bad things to people and, 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 and just be nice to people and be kind. But to get to that level and begin to create culture that can uproot it, that's a taller order than given to the United Negro College Fund.
This question, um, comment and question from Christine. Hello, Resma and Robin. I'm an educator working on my doctorate, looking to cultivate a curriculum for pre-service teachers that is anti-racist. I'm also a middle school teacher who works with seventh graders. Where is a good starting point? Well, I mean, I, I, I just think yourself is the good starting point. That, mm -hmm. um, that analogy of uh, on the airplane, you need to put your oxygen mask on first before you turn to others. And the more, I really believe the more integrated this is into your own life, into your own relationships, into your own uh, practices, the less uh, you have a question of what do you do. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's just the way you're oriented to the world, and you have uh, and to other people, and to your place in the world, mm -hmm. and you, and you've developed um, skills and perspectives, and um, you've you've been vulnerable and humble, and you've made mistakes, and you've repaired those, and learned and grown and integrated. Um, there are so many resources out there. You can go to my website and go to the resources page and there's even a section on you know, uh, uh, education and all of that's out there. Yeah. Um, and so maybe I would just offer a question, which is how have you managed to be in a PhD program and um, an educated person working with young people and not know the answer to that question? Good, that's, I'm so glad you said that. That's what I was just getting ready to say. And I don't mean, and it's, it's meant to be a challenge, but it's all really like take out a piece of paper and like, That's right. how have I come to be this place certified right. as highly educated, right. certified as qualified to work with young people? And I can't answer that question. Right. Um, and whatever you write down, that's going to be your map and that's nothing right. on it will be easy or yeah. quick, but yeah. it, it can all be done. I would start. I would start with everything that Robin just said, and then I would add, uh, uh, get get together with two other white bodies and go through this through this exploration together, um, and commit to doing that for from this point on, from 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 the day that you ask this question to the day you die, to the day that they bury you or or you bury them. To the day y'all have babies together, or the day that you that you that you get married or get into a like. Like that's how deep this is for me. It is like I, you're committed to ushering in a living embodied anti-racist culture, um, and so I would start with that. I would start with uh, with um, going to my website resma.com, R-E-S-M-A-A.com. There are a bunch of resources up there, and start with my grandmother's hands, which has pieces in there and also practices. Um, that you can begin to work with and, and, and surface and, and, and um, metabolize some of this. This question and comment is from Karen. Thanks for your comments on niceness. My question is about white people looking inward instead of outward. I just published a book called Beyond Karen, <coughs> white supremacy and calling in of the Karens in America. And I'm seeing just a lack of interest in my webinars as if white people coming together to discuss the topic of white race is illegitimate without BIPOC leadership. Are you hopeful in the prospects of white people learning to embody the truths of injustice? Actually, I have thoughts. I'd love Resma. So what do you think about white people learning about racism in all white space? Um, it's what, so, so for me, I think like, you know me, before, before white people come in, when I'm doing my work, before white people come in and we start doing like real, like in-depth work together, they have to do some shit with each other first. I will not allow white people with no, no, if no understanding of toxicity, no understanding of the reflexiveness, no understanding of the charge. When I'm, I split people up first, right? I have bodies of culture. I have, I have, uh, I have white bodies getting some uh, remedial stuff done. I don't think that, oh, we just need to all get in a room and just talk and, and do that. There's so much wounding that happens um, when, 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 when those types of things are just left open. And so I have people doing that. And then periodically I control when people come back together and people are able to, to do some of those pieces. I think one of the reasons why people are not coming is that um, many times 
when you show up, especially white folks, white practitioners, when they show up, they haven't taught the community, the white community, how to even use them. This it's like it's like it's like showing it's like showing somebody a hammer who's never seen a hammer. What will it take for people who believe themselves to be white to voluntarily relinquish white supremacy? Oh Jesus. Um I, it, one way to think about that question is what's in it for us, because yep. some of it is is having to um not do it for them. Um, but to understand that actually um, whiteness, as, as my colleague Debbie Irving says, uh, whiteness is not your friend and does not love you. <laughs> um, uh, as Jonathan Metzl argues, dying of whiteness, as Heather mm -hmm. McGee in uh, The Sum of Us argues, um, yeah. that it takes an incredible, enormous amount of effort and energy to keep this system going. It takes a cutting off of ourselves and our own humanity. Um, there are many things I believe we would have like universal health care and universal education if we uh, weren't uh, told that that would mean we had to share it with people who didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are highly manipulable. I mean, look where we are with CRT, like mm -hmm. that is such a perfect boogeyman. Mm -hmm. And look how effective it is. We mm -hmm. are so uh, manipulable because of this animus and this fear. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we recognize that, uh, we, we will start doing the collective work. I would say uh, white folks ain't gonna give up nothing voluntarily that they are advantaged by. It's go you're gonna have to create a new world that other white people, that people, white folks who believe that it is, that it is part of their role on this earth to usher in a living embodied anti-racist culture. You're gonna to have to create another reality. And hopefully those white people who believe that will come and those that won't will be outside the door trying to burn your house down and crap in your halls. And just um, in case anybody's feeling discouraged, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I um, am clear that racism isn't gonna end in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the most um, profound journey I ever have been on or could be on. And I, I do remember uh, Derek Bell. Uh, yeah. uh, he is passed now, uh, a legal scholar. And his book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, of the he well. basically yeah. says, accept that racism will never end. And from there, never stop fighting it. And, and I had to sit with that. And I think what he's saying is that kind of those little carrots they dangled out. Look at, we've got the civil rights movement. Look at, yeah. we've got the Voting Rights Act. Racism's yeah. over, we can all rest now. Mm -hmm. that, that, that allowed us to kind of buy into things that were really just distractions and we That's got right. complacent. And right. there, there are polls that show that a lot of those people that got involved in the summer, a lot of white people are no longer involved. Absolutely. And, you yep. know, we, we, just, we just can't be complacent, so. Those are my closing thoughts. Well, what about you, Resma? I'm good. That's it. I'm <laughs> done. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time tonight, uh, Robin D'Angelo and Resma Menikem. Um, we've had so many questions. There was just no way we were going to get to all of them. My apologies to folks whose questions we did not have time to answer. Um, we will post this as a podcast that you can see on our website at freelibrary.org slash author events. Um, my video guy's gone, but we'll get it up on YouTube. <laughs> um, so until then, Robin, Resma, again, good luck with your books. Thanks mm. for your time this evening and your good work. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Take care, y'all.